Hello, hello, hello. How are you doing this afternoon? Doing well? Oh, good, good, good. This is a fun day, isn't it? Because this is a day where we get to talk about more big ideas and less semicolons and, and curly braces. And this is a big idea as well, but it's a big idea that focuses on what I affectionately call the littlest cloud. The littlest cloud is your home network. So if you've already heard the punchline and don't care about this, you're more than welcome to leave. You won't hurt my feelings. But we're going to spend the next 60 minutes talking about home networking because this is such an underutilized, underappreciated cloud. Most of us are excited about the cloud, but the cloud is what's going on out there on other people's servers, right? That's my affectionate definition of what the cloud is. The cloud is other people's servers. But the littlest cloud now is focusing on your devices, the devices you have in your home. So that's what we're going to talk about. So my name is Scott Davis. This is something that I've done quite a bit with. Um, I enjoy doing web development on mobile devices, on iPhones and Android. Not native development, but mobile web development. I also had the opportunity to be the architect on a smart TV project. Worked for a cable TV company in the US, and they said, we want to be able to take Samsung smart TVs, pull them out of the box, and hang them on the wall. And with no wires, no HDMI cables, no uh, coaxial cables, no anything like that, we want the smart TV to participate with all the other devices in your house. And we thought to ourselves, how hard can that be? It's a smart TV, right? Oh, you have no idea the challenges we come across. So that's what we're going to talk about for the next 60 minutes. The challenges, and of course the rewards, of taking advantage of the littlest cloud, the home network, and all the consumer electronic devices we have in our lives. Because when people talk about scaling, so often they mean, does it scale up? Does it scale up? Does it scale up? As software engineers, I can only imagine that you all drive a bus to work, right? And I don't mean ride the bus. I mean you went out and purchased a bus, and you drive that to work every morning, right? Because we're interested in scaling. What if you need to take 20 of your friends out for drinks one night. Could your tiny little four-seater car manage that? No. So we have to scale it, right? We have to scale it up. So perhaps a bus wouldn't be big enough. Maybe you need to have a, um, you know, an 18-wheeler, you know? Maybe you need to have a, a battleship, you know, to do these kinds of things. And you're correct in thinking that there are challenges at scale. Many times when we're on the internet, we're concerned about scale because we say, oh, look at the problems Google ran into. Or look at the problems Facebook faces dealing with all their users. Or Twitter, or Netflix, or YouTube. You know, YouTube gets close to 40 hours of new videos uploaded every hour. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. They have essentially a week's worth of video being uploaded every hour. They have literally more video being uploaded than anyone could watch in the same amount of time. So clearly what we need to do is scale all of our systems to that level, right? No, not right at all. It's important to be able to scale down as well. Because we do want to have devices that we can put in our pockets. This is a quad-core processor that we're carrying around. Now, does it have as much hard drive storage as my laptop? No. Does it have as big a screen? No. So this is clearly a worthless device? No. In fact, this is a device that we're using more often than not these days. Statistic after statistic after statistic shows that this is our primary computing device. In 2011, 
2011, smartphones began outselling desktops and laptops. That was six years ago. Last year, internet traffic from mobile devices across the world surpassed internet traffic from laptops and desktops. So not only are these outselling more PCs, they're using more bandwidth. They're being used more as we go along. And just in March, just last month, Android surpassed Windows as the most used operating system. In March of 2017, Android surpassed Windows as the most used operating system. Scaling up is very important, but scaling goes both directions. And we need to be able to scale down just as easily as we scale up. And this is especially important when we start talking about the Internet of Things, right? Are these IoT devices giant rack-mounted 7U devices? No, they get smaller and smaller and smaller and multiply and multiply and multiply, yes? So I love the fact that, yes, the Internet of Things is far bigger than everyone realizes, but it's also far smaller, isn't it? Another aspect that we're going to talk about quite a bit is this idea of the Internet of Things that revolves around machine-to-machine -machine communication. And I agree with that definition. The IoT, these smart devices, are connected devices. Can we really talk about IoT without talking about networking and connectivity? No. Because we've had that for the entire history of civilization, right? Our rocks on the ground are not connected devices, yes? The trees aren't talking to each other, although in fact they are, but that's a story for another day, right? Yeah, but we begin seeing that it's the connected nature of these tiny little devices. That's really the story here when it comes to IoT. So when we think about having this world wide web, this internet of connected things, we get really excited. But then when you start looking at individual use cases, and you start saying to yourself, how important is it for me to change the thermostat in my house in Colorado while I'm in Bengaluru? Now, I didn't say how exciting would it be, because I can do that right now. I can reach, it, reach into my pocket. I have a smart thermostat on my wall, so I could reach into my phone and I could adjust the thermostat from here. It's undeniably cool that I can do it. But what's the value proposition? Is it important that I can do it? Venkat discussed that in his last uh, presentation, didn't he? He discovered that one of the great hidden treasures of Google Docs is to be able to mess with his wife from across the world. When she's in Google Docs editing that document, he can get it at the same time and mess with her while she's, while she's doing it. That's a wonderful benefit. But was it the intended benefit? Yeah, probably not. Yeah. So really, these connected devices, these smart devices, these laptops and smart TVs and tablets and iPhones and sensors in your house, yes, that it's wonderful that they can all be connected. And yes, it's wonderful that they can all be connected globally. But if we take an honest look at the usage patterns and the real value proposition, it invariably comes back to the littlest cloud not the World Wide Web. 
so son, and I apologize about this. For some reason, my computer has lost its mind. Um, I'll scoot this over a little bit so we can see it all. There we go. Um, when Sun famously said this in the last century, the network is the computer. We used to think of it as, well, we have computers, and oh yeah, we can network them as well. But then we got to a point where we said, what's the value of having a non-networked computer? You know, if I can't send email, if I can't surf the web, if I can't log on to GitHub, if I can't get to Facebook, if I can't do any of these kinds of things. So we started realizing that the network is the computer, or stated another way, it's the important part of the equation. Metcalfe's Law came out, and again, I apologize that for some reason this overhead projector has kind of lost its mind a little bit. Um, you may have heard of Metcalfe's Law. This came around at a time when uh, networking was just beginning popularized, and in fact, Robert Metcalfe, the inventor of Ethernet, of all things, came up with this idea. And he said the value of a network is not just the simple summation of the nodes, it's actually some of the square of the nodes. In other words, the value of a network doesn't simply go up arithmetically, it goes up exponentially the more people you add to that network. So this network up here, yeah, we could say that has an arbitrary value of two. But that lower network doesn't have a value of five. It has a value of 25. Because what can we begin doing with five people connected to each other? Well, one of those people can publish a web server. One of those people can have an email server. One of those people can have a database server. You begin seeing that, that then the value multiplies dramatically just by having these various nodes connected to each other. Yeah. So when we start talking about smart homes, start thinking about how many devices you have in your home right now. I've got four people in my family. So I have three smartphones. I have four people in my family, so I have five iPads. Of course, right? The math works out perfectly. Yes. I have four people in my family. I have three laptops. I have four people in my family. I have three gaming systems. I have a Nintendo Wii and an Xbox and a new Nintendo Switch. Yes. I have three televisions that are all smart TVs. I have Roku boxes. I have Apple TVs. I have Chromecast sticks. I have all manner of things. So what's the value of my home network based on all that? Sadly, it's far less than n squared of all those devices because they aren't fully networked. Can your Xbox talk to your Wii? Can your Wii talk to your TV? Well, yes, because you've got them physically tethered, but that's cheating, isn't it? Yeah. What if they were unplugged? Could your smart TV talk to your cable set-top box if it was unplugged? Could it talk to your gaming system if it was unplugged? Could it talk to your Xbox, or your, to me, your Apple TV if it was unplugged, right? Some of your devices recognize each other. If you're used to dealing with Apple devices, you have bonjour, right? They are aware of each other. It's always fun going into a coffee shop and opening up your MacBook Pro, right? Because you can start seeing, would you like to play Susie's music or Phil's music or Jenny's music, right? Because these devices naturally want to network with each other. But Apple devices and Windows devices don't do that, and Windows devices and Linux devices don't do that. So the value we're talking about here in your smart home is not just that you have smart clocks and speakers and lights and doorbells and cameras and windows and on and on. And it's not that you can connect your doorbell to the internet and your window to the internet and all these devices 
to the cloud, the big cloud, right? The value is when you get all of these devices talking to each other. That's when the n squared equation kicks in. So the littlest cloud, in fact, is the highest value network that we're not taking advantage of at this point. So, I mentioned earlier, I have a smart thermostat in my house. You've probably heard of the Nest, that's Google's. Um, I ended up going with a different one, the Echo Bee. What I loved about it is not only did it have the big black box that sat on your wall, and of course it's touch screen and all that other wonderful stuff. It's got an iPhone app so I could mess with my family just like Venkat messes with his family. Yeah? But what I loved about it was it came with a sensor, a little white sensor. And it had no UI, it has no screen, it's not tappable or touchable or readable. But it allowed me to put the thermostat on the first floor of my house and the wireless sensor in our master bedroom. That was the value proposition for me. Not being able to change the temperature from Bengaluru, but it's I now have a much more comfortable house. Our master bedroom was always too hot or too cold. My wife was always running a fan constantly up there or having to interrupt whatever she was doing to go up and open windows or close windows or open the blinds or close the blinds or turn on the fan or turn off the fan, constantly managing that. And by adding one tiny little sensor up there, now all of a sudden our bedroom is incredibly comfortable all the time. And it's extensible as well. I could buy additional sensors and put one in the basement and one over here. But at that point, I've exceeded the intelligence of my HVAC system, right? It will only push out the same amount of air to all rooms. I don't have thermostats in each individual room. But we could conceivably get to that point, couldn't we? Where all of a sudden, our house is smart enough to not just have different sensors, but actually be able to pump different amounts of air-conditioned air or heat to the various rooms. This is a good first step. When I listen to music in my house, I use the Sonos. Sonos is a series of speakers that you can put up, but they're not cassette players. They're not CD players. They don't load up the MP3s on them. What they allow you to do is strategically drop speakers throughout my house. I have a speaker in the kitchen. I have a speaker up in the master bathroom so we can listen to music loudly while we shower. I have one speaker that travels around. So when I'm out in the garage doing work, I have a speaker with me. Or when I'm down in the basement doing work, I have a speaker with me. But can you see how these speakers can not only pull in music from Spotify or Pandora or Amazon Music. They also can play my local supply of music. So I have speakers that can all play a common set of ripped CDs. And of course, I have an Amazon Echo in my house. I've got a real crush on a girl in my life right now. Well, one of them is Libby, my daughter. And one of them is Kim, my wife. But there's a third woman in my life, and it is Alexa. Yeah. But my wife's well aware of it. She actually bought me Alexa. If you can get your wife to buy you a girlfriend, I highly recommend it. Yes. But Alexa has absolutely changed the way we deal with computing in our house. Because now we do it through a conversational UI. I love being able to walk into my kitchen in the morning and say, hey, Alexa, play me some Bob Marley. And she does. I love being able to cook with my daughter. We make pancakes and waffles and things in the morning. So as we have our hands deep in the batter, it's so nice to be able to say, hey, Alexa, set a timer for nine minutes. These are the kinds of things that are nice. But in each case, I'm talking directly to Alexa. And while there's real value in that, this, I think, is going to be the hidden value. Alexa is being positioned as not just an endpoint, but a hub. 
So being able to say, hey Alexa, dim the lights. Hey Alexa, turn up the air conditioning. Hey Alexa, play me some Bob Marley. You begin seeing how Alexa is now a hub to control various different things. That's where I think the real value proposition is. We're getting to the place now where we're just getting used to having her in her house, but eventually we will expect her to do more, and that's help control our house as well. So when you look at the services that you can access from Amazon Alexa, from the Echo device, you can get weather, but that of course comes from the cloud. You can play NPR, but that comes from the cloud. ESPN from the cloud. Pandora, Spotify, Apple Music, Google Play, Wikipedia, Google Calendar. Cloud, 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 cloud. Why do we find cloud integration so common among all of our devices? Well, because it's easy. It's easy to do. We're already doing these kinds of things. And I'm not taking anything away from the Amazon engineers that did this. The women and the men who put together this did a wonderful amount of work integrating with all of these other well-established cloud-based services. But when you read the fine print, Alexa does not appear to be capable of playing music streamed from a local UPnP or DLNA server. Oops. Now, we're going to talk about what UPnP and DLNA is, so that's not the important part of the story, right? The local part of that is the important part. We have a home automation hub that is blissfully unaware of the same set of music I am using to drive my Sonos device, those local music stores. And if we go back and read the fine print a little bit more, they said, oh, certainly we can control your thermostat. There's Nest right there. But how is Alexa going to do that? I'm going to talk to Alexa. The command is going to go out to the internet. It's going to go over to the Nest API and come back down into my house. If I'm standing this far away from my Nest thermostat, Alexa is taking the longest possible route to get there, isn't she? She's circumnavigating the globe in order to get to this thermostat that I can reach out and touch. And that's true of all of these things in here. Philips Hue are smart light bulbs, but you control your light bulbs through the internet connection. Um, smart things and Insteon and even my beloved Sonos down here the only way Alexa can interact with these things if they are internet exposed. Security is a real issue these days, isn't it? It's one thing for Yahoo to lose a billion user accounts. Oh, that's a bummer, right? Because at most, I'm affected one time, right? But as I start adding more and more of my things to the public internet, I'm exposing myself now. I'm worried about Venkat because he would be just the type that would change the temperature on me knowing that I'm at home and he's in Bangalore, right? Because I can't fight back at that point. He's well out of arm's reach, but he could be messing with my Google Docs and my thermostat and my music, yeah, and dimming the lights on me and all manner of things, yeah? It's a good thing Venkat's a nice guy. That's the only thing saving us from that equation, yeah? So, this lack of local UPnP support is concerning. It doesn't mean that this device doesn't interest me. The fact that Alexa is a hackable device, that she has this Alexa skills kit, and isn't that cute because you ask Alexa how to do things, and so you have the Ask SDK to do that. I like little cute things like that, yeah. So there is some hope that we can add this functionality later on, but as you'll find out, we need to make sure the basics are in place. So I have high hopes for Alexa as a home automation hub, as long as we have some important prerequisites taken care of. And that's what we'll talk about right now. But what have we learned? Internet of Things
is really nothing more than a bunch of smart connected devices. And I don't mean to diminish it because that's huge, right? But when the narrative is about connecting those tiny little things to the cloud, realize that the reason why that's touted as such a value is not because it's important, because it's easy. And we really need to be focusing not on the easy things, but the important things. The important things. All right. We have about 30 minutes left. Yeah, we're about halfway through here. Wonderful. So I'm going to give you a couple examples here. We're going to talk about UPnP, universal plug and play. We're going to talk about discovery, how these devices not only talk to each other, but discover each other. And then we're going to wrap up talking about mesh networks. So we have three good concepts to talk about when it comes to the littlest cloud. This is arguably the most important one, though. Universal plug and play. How do we get all these devices talking to each other? I always like giving you external resources, and this is a wonderful book on UPnP. UPnP, designed by example, was actually written by the author of the specification, so incredibly knowledgeable. Do you notice the publication date on this book? Almost 15 years old. Does that concern you? On the one hand, it tells us that this is based on standards that have been around for quite some time. And in fact, that is the case. It's based on TCP IP and UDP and DNS and DHCP and all of the standards we're used to. Yeah? The bad news is it hasn't been updated in over 15 years. And when I say this is the book on UPnP, I mean it's literally the book on UPnP. It's the only book out there that discusses it in any level of detail. And that's the real tragedy about this. Because it's a bit of a hard problem. It's a solvable problem. We have all the raw materials we need, but it hasn't been a priority. And so I'm hoping that when the IoT revolution really becomes, uh, uh, gets to us in full string, we'll recognize that this is a really crucial aspect of it. And maybe we'll get two books on the matter, right? And sometimes when I give this presentation, they say, Scott, aren't you an author? I say, be quiet. Yeah, but this is an opportunity. This is something that uh, needs more uh, people talking about. Because the value proposition is this. We see stock art like this all the time. Oh, look at that happy couple, right? They're, they're, you know, looking at their iPad and looking at the TV, and these are both connected devices, so they're talking to each other. And then you start thinking to yourself, how often does that happen? Can you walk into your house right now and pull out your iPhone and mirror the content you see on your TV? Why not? How long have TVs been around? Since like the 1950s, right? 50, 60, almost 70 years. How long have iPhones been around? Well, at least 10 years, at least, right? Is a TV connected device? Oh, absolutely. We've got cable TV. We've got satellite. We've got high definition TV over the air. It's very connected. Yeah. Is this thing connected? Oh, you bet. It's connected to cellular networks and it's connected to Wi-Fi networks, Bluetooth networks. It's connected to all manner of things. Well, if this thing is connected and my smart TV is connected, how come they aren't connected to each other? And the reality of the situation is it's just never been a priority. The reality of the situation is Samsung is highly motivated to make sure it integrates deeply with other Samsung pieces of hardware, but they've got almost no financial incentive to deeply integrate with LG TVs and Sony TVs, right? Apple has motivation to make sure that their smartphone is deeply integrated with the Apple ecosystem. It talks to other Apple devices and iPads and things like that. What motivation do they have to make your iPhone talk to your Android tablet, right? This is the fundamental problem. 
And what's interesting is we don't have this problem as web developers. I never say, oh, you know what? I'm on a Mac, so all I really care about is Safari. We used to. We used to say this website best viewed in Internet Explorer. This website best viewed in Netscape Navigator. But we found very early on that that myopic, narrow tunnel vision, while at first blush might seem like that's the right strategy, Microsoft was taking a zero-sum game approach saying, if we own all of the internet, well then we don't need to worry about compatibility, just Internet Explorer is what needs to happen. And that's not that far off. At the time, in the late 1990s, Microsoft had a 90% market share in terms of the operating system, which means it had a 90% market share in terms of the browser as well. They weren't motivated to do interconnectivity kinds of things because they felt it was a zero-sum game. We have the whole pie, so why do we worry about integrating? It's very rare that we have a monopoly situation like that. Who sells the most TVs worldwide? Samsung. What's their market share? 30, maybe 40%, right? So we have a big player in the market, but if they only have a third of the market, they should be more compelled to interoperate with these various things. Because will a Samsung TV play information off of a Blu-ray player? Yeah, of course it will, right? Does it have to be a Samsung Blu-ray player? Of course not. Why do they work together? Because of standards. We have standard ways to connect these things. But the standards up to this point have been physically tethering things. You have HDMI cables. You have VGA cables. So I have one way to connect my laptop to a screen, another way to connect a Blu-ray player to the screen. But when we start looking at standards-based solutions and wireless standards-based solutions, there has been no other networking protocol or strategy that's been more resilient, that's been more heterogeneous than web technologies. So a lot of what we're talking about here is trying to bring the existing promise of the web, this vast inter interconnectivity, this lack of concern about individual vendors. The web is a beautiful thing because it's the same experience on a Windows box as it is on a Linux box as it is on a smartphone or a tablet or a smart TV. We want to bring that same level of democracy to home consumer electronic devices. So we've got internet connectivity. One out of every two TVs is connected to the internet in the US. The only problem is it's not always the TV. The most popular way to get your TV connected to the internet is a video game console. Since most games have downloadable content, one of the first things you do is connect your game console up to the internet. You connect your TV to the game console. Ah, look, now I have Netflix. Most people don't think about how they're getting to the internet. They just know, oh, look, I can play YouTube now on my TV. Isn't this cool? Right? You might get it through streaming media players like Roku or Apple TVs or Chromes, uh, uh, Chromecasts. You might get it through Blu-ray players. Almost every Blu-ray player now has network connectivity because Blu-rays have the ability to connect you to online content. DVDs used to be all self-contained, but Blu-rays almost always, when you go looking into those extras, will take you off to some companion website or give you the ability to download additional content. So we have lots of connectivity floating around, but it's not always the TV itself. And that makes it difficult as well. Because all of a sudden you've got this weird combination problem. How do I support a Wii and a Samsung TV and an Xbox and a Sony TV and a PS4 
and an LG TV, right? I mean, it begins to be a more complex problem. Now, it's not complex if we focus on standards, but it is complex at first blush when you have all these different vendors giving you all these different ways to accomplish the same thing. So this is where universal plug and play comes in. You're familiar with plug and play, not the you part, but plug and play. It is amazing how sophisticated our computers are. I remember when we had to do things like load printer drivers, right? Now I just hit print and it says, oh, let me look around the network, see if there are any printers around. Oh, there's one. Do you want to print to that one? I want you to think what happened. I didn't have to physically tether to that printer. I didn't have to configure the printer software. I just hit print, and like magic, it happened. That magic is the universal plug and play. Nowadays, when you buy a new home router, you plug it into your cable TV provider, and then you tether into it, and you go in and configure it that way. When people were originally envisioning this, one of the original use cases for this was configuring new routers. You came home, plugged in a new router, and it would just start advertising itself. And you could turn around and say, oh, look, there's a new router. Let me go ahead and configure it. What was the drawback to that scenario? It's a security problem again, right? If you plug in a network and let it announce and announce and announce, what happens if your teenage neighbor next door gets to your router before you do, right? That's a problem. That's a problem. Security is a problem. There's a great joke. I say it's a great joke because I'm kind of a geek. The S in IoT stands for security. We are so excited about connectivity these days that security is not even an afterthought. It's a not thought at all. I was chief web architect for a company that was doing IoT. They had an endpoint on their device named slash backdoor. <laughs> and if you visited slash backdoor in your browser, what did you get? Root level access to the root directory on the device. So they gave me an endpoint called backdoor that gave me root level access to the root of the device. The S in IoT stands for security, right? Yeah, yeah. So security will be an important thing as we consider this as well. But we want to focus on the connectivity First, keeping security in mind, always being aware of that, but we haven't solved the connectivity problem yet. So this UPnP allows all these different consumer devices to find each other through standard TCP IP and HTML and XML and SOAP, all that kind of good thing. We have different roles. We have control points and controlled devices. So if I pull out my iPhone and want to change the channel on my TV, my iPhone is the control point, and my TV is the control device. But by the same token, if I pull out my TV remote and I say, I want to see the new pictures I took on my iPhone, the roles are then reversed, aren't they? My TV is the controlling device, and my iPhone is the controlled device. So these roles are very fluent, and many times both devices can manage them in a very different way. But the important thing out of this is that this is zero configuration network. Just like that printer story I had, plug and play is you plug a device in and it just works. Zero configuration network is you just join the network and it just works. You don't have to do anything else. And that sounds like it's a big promise. In fact, it's a little bit easier to do than you might consider. So DLNA is something that you might be more familiar with. DLNA is the Digital Living Network Alliance. It sits on top of UPnP, but it is strictly dealing with video. The consortium made up of cable TV companies and electronic providers are a way for you to get video to your device as quickly as possible. There's an initiative called Disney Anywhere. Are any of you familiar with that, the website Disney Anywhere? 
It's lovely. You go to Disney anywhere and you say, oh, you know what? I bought Finding Nemo on DVD. Once you register that, Disney says, great, you can now watch it on any device you want. You can watch it on an Android phone, you can watch it on an iPhone, you can watch it on your TV at home. That Disney Anywhere is a way for you to register that content once and play it anywhere. The reason you have to register it is because we're worried about security. And so DLNA is really focused on DRM. But once they're comfortable that they can securely share that information, then we can just focus on the sharing information part. See how security and connectivity work hand in hand? Yeah. So the reason why this is such a big deal is that there are over 25,000 models that support DLNA. Now let me say that again. There are over 25,000 smart televisions and Blu-ray players and Roku boxes and things like that that are all DLNA enabled. And while that's an impressive number, it translates to over 6 billion DLNA-enabled devices out in the wild. This is a huge opportunity for us to take advantage of. Samsung did it by taking DLNA, that underlying standard, but they rebranded it as AllShare. And it really worked. The irony is, though, that the all share worked with Galaxy phones and Samsung TVs and Blu-ray players, right? The all in all share was all of your Samsung devices can share information together, right? Wait, what was that middle part you said? I said all of your Samsung devices can share that information. Yeah, and I can't blame Samsung. That is in their financial best interest. It was a lovely, seamless, Scenario, they said all share was DLNA on steroids, and that wasn't overstating the case. Apple does a wonderful job of integrating all theirs. They don't use UPnP. They don't use DLNA, which is really unfortunate. Samsung does, which means you could begin using that DLNA to connect other devices. It maybe wasn't as seamless, but it was possible. Apple is using a proprietary solution, there's no chance of you connecting these other things unless Apple has provided the solution. As big of an Apple fanboy as I am, this disappoints me. I love my Apple devices, but I also love my Samsung devices. And I always love my Sony devices and LG devices and Xboxes and things like that as well. So while this is a beautiful, elegant solution, it's a narrowly scoped beautiful, elegant solution. Apple TV has been around for years. It first came out in 2007 when the first iPhone came out. This is such a missed opportunity for Apple. They could have had that smart home. They could have had that connectivity. And they're trying through the home kit and the health kit and various things like that. They're really trying, but because of this narrow proprietary focus, it's never going to be a universal solution like universal plug and play. Yeah? So, AirPlay is their solution to this. And it's a very good one. It's a very good one, but it's an Apple only solution. Well, if all of our devices are now connected through UPnP, the next thing we have to do is discover them. And this is an interesting concept, and it's a hard one for web developers to get their mind about around. They're like, oh, discoverability, you mean like Google? No, no, that's not what I'm talking about. Oh, you mean discoverability like DNS? No, that's not what I'm talking about either. I'm talking about discoverability. What if someone in the world somewhere published a new website and that website opened up in a new tab in my browser? That's what I mean by discoverability. Sometimes we think of it as push, but it's not so much push as it is just discovery. Now that scenario I painted 
would be completely unmanageable, wouldn't it? Because we're talking the big cloud. But if we talk the littlest cloud, this is a really compelling story. And this is the other important part of our littlest cloud scenario. Now, addressing takes place using DHCP. You're familiar with this. This is well understood, well established. So every consumer electronic device you have can participate in DHCP. So they can all be connected. That problem is solved. But then how do they discover each other? Well, the way they discover each other is there's a well understood protocol called SSDP, the Simple Service Discovery Protocol. And the way it works is that it is completely serverless and not on the serverless that I was talking about earlier. It's serverless in the fact that it just deals with announcements. It just says, hey, I'm a Samsung TV. Hey, I'm a Samsung TV. Hey, I'm a Samsung TV. Right? That would be terrible to manage at a global level. But in a home networking scenario, it's perfect because then UPnP gives everyone the connectivity they need. And then SSDP gives them the discoverability they need to interact with each other. Now, the way this works is it's based on UDP. Now, this is where we go back to your computer science 101, isn't it? Do you remember the seven layer network model? Of course you do, right? You say it to yourself every night before you go to bed, yes? Yeah, I don't remember all of it. But this is a nice review. The lowest level, the link level, is Ethernet, or Wi-Fi, or your cellular network, or Bluetooth, right? It's, it's that lowest level, it's how they connect. The internet level, IEP, we talk about IEP addresses all the time, don't we? So the IEP address is how you get there. The next layer up, the transport layer, now that we know where we're going, TCP, gives us guaranteed delivery. I send it to you and you acknowledge that you received it and so I send you the next package. You acknowledge and I send you the next. You can see how there's a lot of overhead in this guaranteed delivery, right? It's very reliable, but it's also very chatty. So UDP, the user datagram protocol, works at the same level as TCP. We have IP addresses like this, but this IP address isn't a single point. It's not a device on my network. It's a stream. And so I can send things to that IP address and that port, and everyone else who's subscribed to that stream will get values off of it. We're spending so much time talking about reactive programming, aren't we? And streams and event-driven programming. And my goodness, we have had this since the very beginning of the internet. That IP address is not a TCP IP address. It's a UDP IP address. And what that means then is I can start sending these things out and anyone who's subscribed to that IP address will receive the response. That sounds nice for anyone who's interested in, I'm a Samsung TV, I'm a Samsung TV, I'm a Samsung TV, right? To subscribe to that and get those announcement packets. UDP is interesting in that it is a local phenomena. Most of your routers will route TCP IP traffic by design, right? That's the whole point of a router. It's meant to get your request from your house out to Google and back again. But another important role of routers is that they block UDP traffic. They keep UDP traffic local to this segment. So if this, in fact, is a Samsung TV, I'm not spamming the entire internet 
with an announcement that I got a new Samsung TV. So scaling up is important, but scaling down is important as well. Routing traffic outside of your network is important, but keeping traffic local to your network is important as well. So the UDP attributes get used all the time. Did you know that when you make a DNS request, you're using UDP? And if you think about it, you're saying, hey, what's the IP address for Netflix.com? You can send that out. And if you get a response back, that's great. If you don't, you'll probably just send it out again, right? But this is a great example of UDP in action. DHCP is a great example. DHCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. That's how you get an IP address, right? How do you get an IP address if you don't already have an IP address? You send out a UDP announcement saying, hey, can I get, a UDP, uh, can I get an IP address over here? Right? I start publishing to a well-known stream, and my DHCP server is listening. And then it says, oh, perhaps you would like this IP address. Yeah? All right. I bring up UDP in this talk because quick is going to be a reality very shortly. Quick is a Google protocol called quick UDP internet connections. Every bit of internet traffic you're sending out right now is TCP based. Everything you're sending out is request, acknowledge, request, acknowledge. Google is experimenting with this quick saying, what if we put packets out more quickly on the wire? It'll still be secure, but it'll dramatically improve performance. And by dramatically, I mean dramatically, because we don't need to get all those acknowledgement packets back. You are using Quick right now, and you don't even realize it, if you're using a Google Chrome browser talking to any Google properties out on the web. If you do Google searches or YouTube or anything like that, if you install this HTTP2 indicator that'll give you a little lightning bolt up there, that lightning bolt will not only tell you about HTTP, it'll tell you about quick. And if you visit Google and turn on this quick indicator, you'll see that all of that traffic is coming down via UDP. What's interesting is we got HTTP2 because Google was working on a protocol called Speedy. And once they had proven it in the wild, Speedy was talking to Chrome, Gmail, and YouTube, and all these other things. Once they found that Speedy worked, they submitted it to the IETF, and it got standardized and became HTTP2. That's what I'm going to talk about tomorrow. Quick is on that same path. So once Google has proven it out in the wild, and once it gets accepted by IETF, um, it might end up being yet another way we do transport. It should dramatically improve performance, dramatically reduce network and transport latency, but be secure out of the box. That's the holy grail. So we're talking about discovery. We've done DHCP, so we have an IP address. Now we're going to send out a packet saying, hey, I'm here. This is kind of what that ends up looking like. We have a whole bunch of devices sending that announcement to that well-known UDP spike, that, 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 that UDP stream. And then our control points over here also know about that. So if I pull out my iPhone, it's going to subscribe to that channel, and all my devices are saying, hey, I'm still here, I'm still here, I'm still here. That's how that list is always up to date. It'll never be stale modulo a couple seconds, right? Because this is how it works. This is the advertising that we're talking about here. So this is what that packet actually looks like. It's an SSDP alive packet. I'm alive. It lives. I'm not dead yet. The jokes just keep coming, right? Um, but this is the alive packet. And what you do is you're sending it out to that UDP stream, but you are giving yourself a URL. So you're announcing that, hey, I'm alive, but you're giving people a way to get back to you directly. And that is how SSTP works. Now what I love is you've got an alive packet, but you don't have a dead packet. Right? That would be a little bit morbid. So instead, you say bye-bye. 
Whenever you turn off your device, whenever you go into airplane mode, whenever you walk out the door, your device starts sending out bye-byes, right? And you start saying to yourself, well, wait a second. What if you just rip the Ethernet cable out of the back of your system, right? It can't send the bye-bye. You're right, but you know what else it can't send? Be alive. Yeah. So if you ab end, if you get off a network unexpectedly, you'll just age out naturally. They'll just be like, hey, are you here? Hey, are you here? No, he's not here anymore. Let's ignore him. Yeah? But in a well-formed way of getting off the network, you'll say, I'm no longer here. I'm leaving. Goodbye. Auf Wiedersehen. Farewell. Yeah? And this is the packet that goes out. So once you have an IP address, once you've announced, once you've been discovered, the next thing you do is you need to describe the services available to you. Because remember, these are TVs and smartphones and Blu-ray players and game systems and Roku boxes, all manner of things by all manner of different manufacturers with all manner of different capabilities. And so what we need to do now is this is HTTP traffic. This is actually a SOAP call, believe it or not. That's how old this protocol is. It used SOAP. Yeah. But this is a SOAP call. But in that announcement packet, you're announcing your endpoint, your IP address. So once I know about you, I can start talking to you directly. So if you think about this architecture, it's chatty in the sense that it needs to be chatty, but it also avoids being chatty. It wouldn't make sense if I said, hey, TV, what capabilities do you have? And have everyone else on the segment hear that conversation. So I am UDP when it makes sense, and I am TCP when it makes sense. But if we want to see what this device description looks like, it has two pieces. One is the device description, where it lists out manufacturer and model and serial number and all manner of things like that. And then the other thing it'll do is list out all the services. Hey, I can play videos. What kind of videos? I can play MPEG-4 videos. Oh, that's nice. Hey, I can play music. What kind of music? I can play AUG tunes. Oh, great. What else can you do? So this is the um, uh, service announcement capability. So in the, what, two minutes we have left, let's discuss mesh, let's discuss, let's discuss mesh networks. I turned into Sean Connery all of a sudden here. Let's discuss mesh networks. There we go. Yes. So mesh networks are something that come up when we're talking about IoT and the home network quite a bit. Because we've spent all of this time talking about IP addresses and TCP and UDP and things like that. And sometimes there's no need for all of that. There's no need for the overhead or there's no need for you to show up on a, device, on a network where you would prefer to be invisible. So mesh networking, sometimes people call it ad hoc networking because typically a mesh network is one device comes up and starts sending out announcements. Hey, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Another device comes up and says, I'm here. And once they discover each other, that's the mesh network. That's the ad hoc network. That is the, the ephemeral network that is just all the devices that are on and announcing themselves at the moment. So this example I mentioned earlier, this device is absolutely on my home Wi-Fi. That's how I can pull out my iPhone and go to the internet, which routes to my local router, which routes to this, so I can turn up the temperature and mess with my wife in Denver. Yeah? But I don't have that same requirement here. I can't ping this. I can't SSH into it. I have no need for that. So in fact, the way this thing is configured is that thing that's hanging on my wall has an IP address, but all those other sensors are a simple little proprietary mesh network. And I honestly don't have any idea what the implementation is because it's black box to me. I, I, I just don't know. But I do know that those little white boxes aren't getting IP addresses. And I do know they are talking to each other. I don't know how. Yeah. Sonos has two different ways you can connect it to your network. In the most simple way, you buy a speaker, 
you come home from Best Buy, you put it on your counter, and it connects to your home Wi-Fi network, and away you go. The concern you might have with that, though, is what happens if your network gets busy? What happens if your son is playing an online game, and your daughter is watching an online movie, and there are other things going on here? So Sonos, in fact, if you buy a bridge, which is another white box that you has an Ethernet connection on one point. But if you do this, and this is actually the recommended way to do it, all of those Sonos networks create their own mesh network. They call it SonosNet, but SonosNet is a secure, encrypted, peer-to-peer -peer wireless mesh network. And what that means now is all of that music traffic isn't interfering and conflicting with all that other IP traffic. But wait, there's more. If this was an IP story, and I had my IP router down here, and some device off in my kitchen on the other end of the house, and signal was weak, I'd have a bad experience. You might say, oh, that's easy. Put another router or a repeater in your kitchen. But Sonos solved that problem because each one of these devices is a mesh network and it's not running over TCP IP anymore. It's its own Sonos Net proprietary network. This living room actually has a sphere of influence right here and it's hard to see, but the library is actually within the living room sphere of influence. And the dining room is within the library's sphere of influence, and the library is within, or the kitchen is within libraries. So all of these networks are bypassing, excuse me, all of these devices are bypassing the IP network. I might have weak signal in the kitchen when it comes to internet, but because of this proprietary mesh network, I have full sound fidelity. So the other thing about this littlest cloud we need to keep in mind is not just auto addressing and not just discoverability, but this idea of mesh networks saying this might be a better solution for what we're trying to get accomplished here. I lose the ability to see that kitchen speaker on the internet because it literally doesn't have an IP address. But do I want to see that kitchen speaker from the internet? And in fact, can I do it by having my router on the internet and then my router, oh, that's right, acting like a router and routing traffic to that thing. And in fact, that's exactly how it works. So to wrap up here, the internet of things is a big, big deal. I agree. This idea of connecting all these devices is a big, big deal because of Metcalf's law. Think about how valuable your home network would be if you just walked in and did nothing but your iPhone, talk to your Android tablet, talk to your Samsung TV, talk to your Amazon Alexa, right? That's the promise. And unfortunately, it's just a promise right now. This is not a technological problem. We have all the raw material we need to solve this problem. This is where it needs to get solved. And you're exactly the ones to do it. That's the littlest cloud. Did you enjoy yourself? Thank you so much. Thank you, Scott.